Every January since the 1960s, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas has been the premier event for tech companies to unveil their latest gizmos and gadgets. Needless to say, as video games started to gain more and more traction in the late 70s and early 80s, CES was the logical place for companies like Atari to show off their latest wares. But as gaming grew into an ever larger market and developed its own subculture, game publishers found that CES wasn't evolving with them. CES tended to sideline the kitty toys in favor of household gadgets like refrigerators and stereos. By the 90s, it was clear that CES was no longer the right space for the rapidly rising industry. In 1994, several of the medium's biggest players banded together into what is known as a trade association called the Interactive Digital Software Association. The IDSA had several jobs, including lobbying for game publishers' rights in Washington. But they also recognized that this would be their best chance to escape from CES. In 1995, they revealed that Summer would see the very first Electronic Entertainment Expo, cleverly shortened to E3. Over the next 15 years, the venture would grow into one of the largest trade shows in the world, experiencing highs and lows as it continually adapted to a changing world, but always emerging as the dominant gaming moment of the year, every year. Right off the bat, it wasn't clear if this new gaming expo would be successful. Indeed, Power Player and Nintendo initially wanted to stick with CES. But their competitor Sega chose to back the new E3 show. Since at the time the Genesis was outselling the Super Nintendo in the US, everybody else went with Sega's choice. In the end, even Nintendo had to swallow its pride and follow along. The industry had spoken. They'd be leaving Las Vegas winters for Los Angeles summers and it turned out to be a perfect year to kick off the new expo. 1995 was a watershed year for the industry, since both Nintendo and Sega had next-gen consoles on the horizon, the Saturn and the Ultra 64, later renamed to the Nintendo 64. More importantly, down the road, Sony announced that their brand new PlayStation console, already released in Japan, would be coming to the United States that Christmas at a jaw-dropping $299. This was a day after Sega priced the Saturn at $399. From that very first year, the major hardware players picked E3 as the place to one-up their competition and kick off their hype machines. It was a smash success with over 50,000 attendees making it one of the biggest expos in the country. Many of those attendees were not in the game-making business. There had been a large number of journalists and the general public. The IDSA had started E3 as a business exposition, where executives and retailers could meet and make deals. Instead, with flashy displays and scantily clad booth babes, the show photographed well and looked great in the press. The gamers of America and the broader world wanted to know everything that was going on at the show. E3 wasn't just a space for the game makers, it was a space for the entire market to get involved. There was no question of doing another one, and 1996 saw the second E3 at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Unfortunately, it quickly became clear that LA wasn't cheap. The cost of the floor space at the center was massive, especially as exhibitor booths got more and more extravagant. In an effort to cut down on costs, the IDSA moved the show to Atlanta for 1997 and again in 1998. However, by the end of the 98 show, everyone agreed that Atlanta lacked a certain magic. Not for the last time, E3 found that without all the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, it just wasn't E3. The convention was headed back to La La Land. The 1999 show in Los Angeles was a huge return to form and another smash success. Almost too much of one. The attendance numbers were rising dramatically year to year and the actual convention was becoming more and more of a mess. Exhibitors were spending well into the millions on their displays and more and more production time and budget was going away from the actual game and towards the booth. Plus, with all the huge crowds, it was harder for the actual industry members to network and make deals, which was the original point of the show. Then in 2000, E3 suffered a blow to its prestige when Microsoft revealed their new Xbox console for the first time at its old rival, CES. The move highlighted the fact that Microsoft wanted their console to be a multimedia device for everyone, not just for gamers. Despite the snub, it did nothing to lessen E3's significance, and indeed, Microsoft has continued to be a major presence at the Expo to this day. By the mid-2000s, the state of the industry was changing, and E3 changed along with it. 
The market was growing and so was outside observation on video game violence and sexuality. In an attempt to make the show more family-friendly, in 2006 the IDSA, now the ESA, Entertainment Software Association, imposed a $5,000 fine on any exhibit with an indecently dressed booth babe. Needless to say, the move wasn't very popular, but later that year they'd make an even less popular announcement. The exorbitant costs and huge attendance numbers had gotten to be too much. Over 75,000 people were going to E3 now. Developers and journalists alike were exhausted by the massive convention and its mammoth after-parties. Sensing that the convention wouldn't survive in its current form, the ESA decided to kick the whole thing down into a much smaller event. Renamed the E3 Media and Business Summit, the 2007 event would be low-key, invitation-only, and held in hotel lobbies around Santa Monica. There would be no huge booths and no massive crowds. However, the ESA had already signed a contract with the City of Los Angeles to use the LA Convention Center until 2012. To get out of the contract, they had to pay a $5 million fee. Despite paying the fine, in 2008 they went back to the LA Convention Center anyway. But even fewer people attended this event than last year, making the huge facility seem deserted. Worse, a number of major players left the ESA that year, including Activision and LucasArts. E3 had lost its glitz and glam, and without it, it just couldn't generate the same hype and buzz as before. Game makers and press both were shocked to find that they actually missed the chaos of previous years. Without it, E3 just didn't seem to have a purpose. Some claimed that it was dead. And so, the ESA changed with the times again. Though the 2009 show would still be closed to the general public, it would no longer be invitation only. Any developer, publisher, or press member could come. In June of that year, E3 exploded back into form with all the wild displays, flashy booths, and booth babes of yesteryear. At 40,000 attendees, it was big again, but also small enough to be manageable. The hype and the buzz was back, and once again, E3 was the show to beat for reveals, announcements, and first looks. 2010's show will hold to the same format, closed to the public, but open to everyone else. As always, a number of major products will be displayed, including Microsoft's Natal and the first showing of Valve's Portal 2. But what is most anticipated is what we won't expect. E3 is set to have another massive year, and for now at least, seems to have found the format that suits it best. The rest is up to the games and the gamers who buy them.